Good morning uh, to those who are on the uh, West Hemisphere and good afternoon to those who have afternoon now. Um, I'm happy that we are back again on our second session after the last one we had on anti-Semitism in United States and Europe. Um, my name is Omar Muhammad and I am a senior researcher at the program on extremism uh, at George Washington University. Uh, today's uh, uh, problem is one of the uh, uh, most pressing problems that we face and requires uh, uh, more honest attention. Uh, since the uh, recent uh, attacks of Hamas against southern Israel on October 7th, we have seen a surge in anti-Semitism that requires more uh, uh, discussions, more honest discussions, requires more uh, 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 attention from many parties. Uh, this problem uh, is not new, it's very old. And today we are trying to address the surge in anti-Semitism, whether it's on social media, whether it's in regular media, in books, in uh, 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 public discourse, and many other uh, uh, platforms, which is why we have with us uh, the most relevant people uh, to discuss this issue. We have with us uh, uh, Dr. Matthias Konzel from Germany. We have Evan Ismail from Sweden, and we have Talor and Vered from Israel, uh, who lead cyber uh, uh, well, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Matthias wrote a very important book on Islamic antisemitism, and lastly, the uh, important uh, uh, dissertation written by Ibn Ismail on anti-Semitism in also the Middle East. Uh, the question of anti-Semitism in Middle East in one of, is one of the most complicated ones. It also requires a very uh, calm discussion because one of the questions is, if we do not address anti-Semitism now, when is the right time? But also, who are the most relevant people or entities to engage in a discussion about anti-Semitism, because that anti-Semitism is no, not only now uh, a rhetoric uh, anti-Semitism, it's also becoming uh, leading to physical threats. But also not to forget, when we speak about terrorism, we know that among the terrorist organizations, including organizations like ISIS, the cornerstone of their ideology is anti-Semitism. How should we deal with this? How should we discuss it? I will leave it to our uh, speakers to uh, tell us more about the current surge in anti-Semitism. And I believe it's better if we start with understanding the current surge. And that's what the uh, representatives of Cyber Whale will tell us. I leave it to you, Vered and Talor. Thank you so much, Omar, and uh, thank you to the uh, esteemed panel that we are honored to join here today. My name is Tal Or Cohen uh, Montemayor. I'm the founder and CEO of Cyberwell. My name is Veren, and I'm the head of research at Cyberwell. Uh, I focus on uh, content, anti Semitic content analysis. Thank you. Uh, we're going to be joining uh, here together in a joint presentation, which I'm going to start now. Uh, specifically, as Omar said, we're going to be looking at the surge in online anti-Semitism uh, in the Arabic speaking world. So our data set is focused on um, a monitoring that we've done since October 7th, looking at the surges and changes in online anti-Semitic uh, content and calls to violence in Arabic speaking uh, content. Uh, so just a word about who Cyberwell is very quickly. We are an Israeli-based nonprofit dedicated to driving the enforcement and improvement of community standards and hate speech policies across the digital space and empowering efforts against anti-Semitism with the data that we collect. Now, in order to achieve that very specific mission, we launched the first ever open database of online anti-Semitic content in May of 2022. Uh, our monitoring technology is based in AI. To date, we've flagged about 240,000 pieces of anti-Semitic content across the five major social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and what was once known as Twitter, now X. 
Um, and we have professionally vetted around 5,000 of those uh, pieces of anti-Semitic content when our role is specifically to work with the social media platforms as a trusted partner to uh, unpack, identify, um, and really uh, flag and thwart these surges in online anti-Semitism as they play out on the major social media platforms. One of the things that's unique about Cyberwell because of our location and also because of the um, access to uh, human resources that we have is that we're monitoring this content, not only in English, but also uh, in Arabic. So I'm very happy to be here with you today to share with you some of the shifts that we've seen in online anti-Semitic content uh, in Arabic. And I'm going to turn the uh, keys over to Vered right now to unpack that data with us today. Thank you, Tal Oh, So yes, here we see a visualized sample of anti-Semitic tropes, which became, some of them became viral since October 7th. And we will discuss briefly some of them in this presentation. So Cyberwell's AI technology detected a sharp increase of almost 86% in flagged content since October 7th. And by flagged, I mean content which uh, was high likely uh, to be anti-Semitic, according to our system, across social media platforms. And in my opinion, this is one of the most important numbers in this presentation, uh, because our work is based on analyzing samples. But the increase of, uh, the, increase of the pot potentially hateful and violent content in percentages, as we can see here, is very sharp since October 7th. You could see it in the previous slide. And uh, here we see... Yes, thank you for that. Social media platforms work differently and the monitoring process depends on the platform and its characteristics and specifics. But when analyzing text-based platforms and here specifically X and Facebook, Cyberwell system also detected a sharp uptick in content flagged as highly likely to be anti-Semitic since October 7th in both of the, both of the platforms, as you can see here, uh, with some differences, of course, in numbers and the percentage of increase. Now, before diving into specifically anti-Semitic narratives, uh, what we did was to look at the trending keywords and phrases in general in the online discourse, and we could see some interesting insights. So first of all, before October 7th, um, we can call it relatively calm times, not a war time, the potential reach of online discourse about Jews as a keyword was way higher than the potential reach uh, of the discourse about Israel, which leads us to the point that it's not a political discourse only. Okay, it focuses on Jews as a collective, even not during a wartime. The second point we saw was a significant shift from the usage of the term Jew in singular to referring to Jews as a collective. And from a semantic point of view, this wave of generalization may indicate some dangerous, alarming changes, both on social media and in the real world perception of Jews. Now, speaking of the location or detection of geolocation or where the post was posted from on social media is very limited and tricky. And usually it's based on the data that the users themselves decide to provide and share with the platform. So in the past two months, Cyberwell was able to detect uh, the geolocation of 12% only of the anti-Semitic posts in Arabic. And I can share with you that some of the detected countries were Egypt, Jordan, Morocco, but also Germany and the US. And it gives us some indications of flows of content and ideas in different languages and spaces. As part of Cyberwall's methodology, we analyzed every single piece of content, every single post, according to the IHRA working definition of anti-Semitism. Uh, which is basically taking a soft power tool and applying it for discourse analysis. And here we can see the comparison of IRA breakdown of content in Arabic in the 25 days before the war and 25 days since October 7th. We can see that the top IRA example, which used to be before the war example number two, dehumanizing and stereotypical allegations against Jews, uh, shifted to example number one, which is calling and justifying violence against Jews. Another thing, we can also see an increase in example 11 since the war began, which is blaming Jews as a collective for being responsible for the actions of the state of Israel or the IDF 
in this case. Also, we can see a shift in trends, not only in IRA specifically, but in the anti-Semitic tropes themselves. Um, here, as you can see from a more general conspiracies in which Jews are blamed, such as global domination, being behind the Freemasonry or the protocols of protocols of the elders of Zion, um, to particular hateful characteristics of Jews, Jews being the enemy, Jews as animals, or Jews as a collective being evil. Now, in the frame of calls to violence, uh, some specific trends our tech detected since October 7th, and these trends were also flagged by us as potentially policy violating to the social media platforms, are this. So first of all, the combination of the general hashtag referring to the war, Telfan uh, al um, and the term Jews, or violent videos or images. Now, the hashtag itself is obviously not offensive but has the potential to promote violence in specific contexts or, or as a part of the combination. Uh, the second trend I will mention is the violent chant Khaybar uh, Khaybar Yahud, referring to the battle between the Prophet Muhammad and the people of Khaybar, which ended in expelling and slaughtering Jews. Uh, and this trend went viral on both social media and real world events and demonstrations. Uh, it's interesting that we brought this slogan to the attention of the platforms for a pretty long time. And only now in the current event, current uh, wartime, we see that this uh, chant is being actively removed from the platforms. And the third trend is uh, the call PUBG the Jews, referring to the popular shooting games. Shooting game, uh, some of you probably know it, uh, which openly calls to violence against Jews. Holocaust hate speech. So we detected two uptics in both English and Arabic. Um, in the usage of the hashtag Hitler was right. In Arabic, it's not exactly a hashtag, but um, the same concept in keywords. Um, the uptics were after October 7th and then right after the explosion uh, in Al Ahli Hospital, uh, with the total potential reach of millions of people which puts a question mark on the policy of freedom of speech, but not a freedom of reach, obviously. And that's something we usually try to do and to connect between the waves of trends online and real world events. The second trend I will uh, refer to is the Houthi slogan calling death to Israel curse on the Jews. And we see objects after October 7th and both before and after the missile attack from Yemen on Israel. Uh, we monitor the slogan regularly, but now it's way easier to show the violent aspect of it and to reflect it to the platforms. The next section uh, is the so-called religious anti-Semitism, and we can see the trending tropes, uh, trending anti-Semitic tropes of Jews being hostile based on quotes um, such as from Surat al-Maida, Khaybar, uh, as we mentioned before, and referring to Jews as animals based on particular commentary of the Quran. And the section of glorification of terror, which is not Cyberwell's regular scope of work, but during this current wartime and the need, some of the recommendations we provided to the social media content moderation teams were to closely monitor the combinations of dangerous organizations, uh, and praising. Now, praising can be the word hero, for example, but it also can be the word shahid, not on its own, because we're familiar with many different meanings of this uh, term, but when referring to a specific dangerous individual or a, a specific attack in real life. Uh, also, the combination uh, combinations of these organizations with the term Jews or Telfan Laksa, for this matter, as we can see, is highly likely to be anti-Semitic. And um, yes, from, them, from this comes the importance of the monitoring and the recommendations provided to the platforms in real time so they can address these issues and trends as quickly and effectively as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Varen. We're going to be getting into the actual policy recommendations in the second part of the discussion. And now we're, we're going to throw it back to you, Omar, and thanks for giving us uh, an opportunity to share these data insights today. Vered and Talor, uh, thank you so much. It's really, uh, it's concerning what you uh, uh, mentioned, what you showed us. Um, and it's another reason why we are meeting here is to discuss this carefully. Um, 
I go to even now, uh, even uh, uh, it seems that anti-Semitism has been for a very long time been normalized in uh, the region. Uh, it's part of, 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 of daily discussions uh, among very young population, very young generation that do not even know the basics of the recent history. They don't know anything about the Holocaust, yet they are engaged in the Holocaust denial. They don't know anything about uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, world relations, yet they are involved in more dangerous anti-Semitism. What does history tell us about this? I leave it to you. Thank you, Amar Mohammed, uh, for inviting me uh, to speak. I have followed your work for a long time, and uh, I am very impressed and honored um, to be here and also to be in this esteemed panel. I will try to share my PowerPoint now. Um, can you see it? Yes, we can. Great. We can Thank so you. So um, I, I have a PhD in sociology uh, from, uh, from Uppsala University in Sweden. And today's presentation will be based on my study, The Anti-Semitic Origins of Islamist Violence, a study of the Muslim Brotherhood and the Islamic State. In it, I trace the development of the main ideas of um, Islamist anti-Semitism from the 1930s until 2018. And the study is available as a PDF, if anyone is interested in it. First, I would like to start with the distinction between Islam and Islamism. Um, I, I believe it's important to emphasize this distinction. Um, and I view Islamism as a politicization of Islam. And Islam is understood as a spiritual faith. To make this distinction clear, many scholars have stated that the Quran is not anti-Semitic. However, Islamists have developed an Islamist anti-Semitism where they claim that Muslims are in a permanent war with Jews. For instance, Lewis here the, have asserted that European anti-Semitism in both its theological and racist version was essentially alien to Islamic traditions, cultures, and modes of thought. Moreover, Firestone concludes that the Quran is not anti-Semitic because it does not racialize or dehumanize Jews. Quote, it would be wrong to label the Quran as anti-Semitic. The Quran does not racialize Jews, nor does it dehumanize them. It certainly does not call for their destruction. End quote. Uh, my main arguments are that is, is that Islamist anti-Semitism anti is an integral part of Islamism. Anti-Semitism, as in the ideology that politicizes Islam and not the religion itself, was born out of anti-Semitism and still depends on it for its survival. Here, the Muslim Brotherhood plays a key role as the first Islamist movement. As shown by uh, Matthias Kunzel, excellent work. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood, um, the Muslim Brotherhood was, were actually financed by the Nazis, um, and it was founded in Egypt in 1928 as a movement that used political institutions in order to Islamize society. Specifically, the Muslim Brotherhood wanted to reclaim what it understood to be the lost dignity of Muslims caused by British imperialism. And in its political endeavor, the Muslim Brotherhood cooperated with Al Husseini, with Palestinian leader Hajami al Husseini, and were financially supported by the Nazis. I argue that the notion of having lost a dignity due to imperialism, which the Muslim Brotherhood was founded on, was channeled into the ideas of Nazism that blamed Jews for the ills of the world. This means that Islamist identity construction is dependent on having Jews as an enemy, and that without anti-Semitism, Islamism and Islamist identity, as we know it today, would not exist. 
Contemporary Islamist anti-Semitism is based on imaginary constructs originating mainly from the Ghargad tree hadith and not Islam's primary source, the Quran, and what I call a politicization of religious identities within a war narrative. The image here is based on a quantitative analysis of anti-Semitism in ISIS propaganda, and it shows that the war against Islam conspiracy is the most common anti-Semitic trope that they use. This conspiracy was laid out by Muslim Brotherhood ideologue Sayyid Qutb. Now I will focus on Sayyid Qutb's anti-Semitism and specifically the development of his conspiracy theory about an ongoing war against Islam. I argue that it has inspired Hamas, the Islamic Republic of Iran and ISIS. Hamas used to rephrase Qutb in their charter. Iran's leader Khamenei translated Qutb's books such as In the Shade of the Quran into Persian. Moreover, an analysis of ISIS propaganda show that their anti-Semitic ideology is heavily influenced by Qutb, especially the conspiracy of a war against Islam that is based on the claim that an, the world is divided into two camps, a Jewish camp and an Islamist camp, where the Jewish camp allegedly wages a war against Islam, Muslims. The war against Islam conspiracy, as developed by Qutb, consists of a combination of his interpretations of the Quran and the conspiracy theory of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. As many of us already know, the Protocols is a fabricated text where Jews, among other things, are accused of wanting to control the world. The conspiracy of the protocols influenced Qutb heavily and has in his Quran interpretation, Qutb's 30 volume work in the shade of the Quran cannot be understood without understanding that he was inserting the conspiracies of the, the protocols into, um, sorry, I just need to change this, into his, just need to, sorry, uh, into his Quran interpretation. So his Quran interpretation is a mix between, uh, mainly he mainly uses the Quran verse of Al-Ma'idah 51, which was mentioned earlier. And it says, quote, take neither Jews nor Christians as guardians, as they are guardians of each other. And Qutb claimed that this is proof that there is a permanent war being waged against Muslims by Jews. This idea was later adopted by ISIS. However, what Qut does not mention in his interpretation of the Quran is that it refers to a specific historical context where Muslims were few and had to focus on unity. Instead, he distorted the meaning of the Quran verse with the help of the protocols by claiming that the verse is proof that Jews are conducting a permanent war against Islam. The idea that he used from the protocols of the, is the belief that Jews want to control the world and other religions. And my claim is that the conspiracy of a of an ongoing war against Islam is is based on this, and it's still being used today. So central to what I call the conspiracy of a war, war against Islam is what I call the imaginary victimized umna, umma, um, namely the idea that Muslims all over the world are victims who are suffering in the war against Islam. Qutb and ISIS heavily draw on this idea to legitimize and mobilize for anti-Semitic violence by claiming that those who are conducting violence against Jews are actually defenders of the imaginary victimized Muslims. For instance, images of Muslims who are suffering in wars are used as a motivator for violence. Um, here is an example of Khamenei saying that Sweden is uh, a part of the war against Islam, which shows uh, uh, how inspired he still is by Qutb's writings, whom he uh, did translate himself. 
So the imaginary victimized ummah is called imaginary not because there are no Muslim victims, but to emphasize that Islamists exaggerate and place Muslim victims into an anti-Semitic ideological narrative that is based on a false claim, namely a conspiracy saying Jews are conducting a permanent war against Muslims and that it requires anti-Semitic violence. This cannot be understated. According to this ideology, there are no civilians and violence against Muslims who support Jews is also seen as justified. I would like to conclude with a few policy recommendations based on my findings. First, in order to counter the influence of the Muslim Brotherhood and to prevent an ideology that incites violence, it is important to strengthen laws against spreading intolerance and incitement to violence through an understanding of Islamist ideology and indoctrination. The Muslim Brotherhood endangers Jewish life in Europe through the influence it has over the interpretations of Islam and the infrastructure it has built with, for instance, schools. Hence, it is crucial to restrict the distribution and access to Muslim Brotherhood literature and to prevent them from having educational institutions. Lastly, I would like to say that it's important to stop the funding of Muslim Brotherhood organizations. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Evan, for all uh, uh, these insights. Uh, it's very important to understand the uh, uh, roots of, of, of this, this uh, uh, problem. Uh, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Consul, as you heard first from uh, uh, the presentation on the current wave of anti-Semitism and also the uh, uh, ideology uh, that is used by Islamist organizations, terrorists. It's almost every every terrorist organization, as I mentioned earlier, has its cornerstone as the uh, anti anti-Semitism is the cornerstone. The first thing they say in their opening is to kill all the Jews uh, uh, using all the anti-Semitic uh, uh, slogans and so on. Uh, 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 even also mentioned about the collaboration between the Nazis and the Muslim Brotherhood and how this brought more normalization to anti-Semitism in the Middle East. And you wrote a very important book about that. Uh, once again, what does that history tell us and how it's connected to the current wave? Okay, thank you very much, Uma Muhammad. Thank you for organizing this important event and for inviting me. My name is Matthias Künstel. I'm from Germany, Hamburg. I'm a political scientist and historian, and I'm interested in the question of anti-Semitism since 30 years. In order to find out how Auschwitz could happen and in order to find out why my both parents loved Adolf Hitler when they were young. So this is my interest in this question and I will start now my 12 minutes presentation. The Hamas massacre of October 7, this ecstatic killing proved that a Nazi-like anti-Semitism flourishes still today and it proves that we have to find out how did this Nazi-like hatred of Jews reach the Arab world and Hamas. The central role of Nazi anti-Semitism in the planning and implementation of the Shoah is well known. The impact of that same Nazi anti-Semitism on the Middle East, on the other hand, remains gravely under-researched. My new book, Nazism, Islamic anti-Semitism, and the Middle East aims to fill this gap to the extent currently possible. It sets forth the methods used by Nazi Germany from 1937 onwards to disseminate its anti-Semitism in the Middle East in the Arabic language and the role that this anti-Semitism would play 11 years later when the Arab armies fell upon the newly founded Jewish state of Israel. It was this fateful war of 1948 
that triggered the Palestinian refugee catastrophe, which has marked the Middle East conflict ever since. Let me please present at least three of my new book's discoveries. First, Islamic anti-Semitism. It was only from the year 1937 onwards that Berlin began massively to intervene in the Middle East conflict. It wanted to prevent the establishment of even a tiny Jewish state as proposed by the Peel Commission in that summer. From now on, the Nazis backed exclusively the anti-Semites in the region, especially Amin al-Husseini, the Mufti of Jerusalem, and the Muslim Brotherhood, which they massively supported financially and ideologically. They saw the clash in Palestine as an opportunity to impose an anti-Semitic interpretation on the local conflict. In the beginning, however, they had difficulties. Muslims were not ready to accept the Nazis' racist anti-Semitism. Quote, the level of education of the broad masses is not advanced enough for the understanding of the race theory, wrote a leading Nazi in Egypt. So the Nazis started to change their language. Now the godless Nazi Germans of all people try to educate Muslims about the expressions of Jew hatred that can be found in Islamic writings. From now on, German propaganda combined Islam with anti-Jewish agitation to an extent that had not hitherto been known in the modern Muslim world. The first document of that kind, written by or with the help of Amin el-Husseini, was a pamphlet titled Islam and Judaism, which I document in my book. It is a shocking text that uses and misuses religion for the sole purpose of inciting Jew hatred. It was first published in 1937 in Cairo in order to derail plans for the two-state solution. During the Second World War, it was printed and distributed in large numbers by German forces and translated into several languages. This pamphlet is the very first major document to construct a continuity between Muhammad's confrontation with the Jews in Medina and the contemporary conflict in Palestine. It concludes with the following words, I quote, the verses from the Quran and Hadith prove to you that the Jews have been the bitterest enemies of Islam and continue to try to destroy it. Do not rest until your land is free of the Jews. We see since 1937, 11 years before the foundation of Israel, Nazis and Islamists were spreading the paranoid idea that the Jews wanted to destroy Islam and that Islam had to fight the Jews in order to survive. Here, those who want to eliminate the Jews pose as victims and project their own desire for destruction onto the Jews. This brings me to my second point, Arabic language radio propaganda. In order to arouse the Arabs on a mass level, the Nazis used their most important propaganda instrument, the shortwave radio transmitter. In April 1939, the Nazis' first Arabic language broadcast came on air. The last would be in April 1945. This six-year barrage of sound embedded Islamic anti-Semitism in the consciousness of the Arab street. Back then, listening to the radio was a public affair. The men listened to it at the bazaar, in marketplaces, and in coffee houses. The broadcasts were well produced with excellent and famous speakers, carefully selected Arabic music, and very good sound quality. The content, of course, was rebel rousing rather than factual. Thus, the United Nations were dubbed the United Jewish Nations, and the Jordanian King Emir Abdullah was mocked as Rabbi Abdullah 
for wanting to negotiate with the Zionists. This kind of propaganda was effective because the Nazis could build on the patterns of early Islamic Judaism and instrumentalized the local conflict with the Zionists. In retrospect, we see that those six years of daily radio propaganda marked a turning point that divided Middle Eastern history into a before and an after. These years worsened the image of the Jews in the Arab world. They fostered an exclusively anti-Jewish reading of the Quran, which continues to this day. They popularized the European world conspiracy myths, which continues to this day. And they shaped a genocidal rhetoric towards Zionism, which continues to this day as well. A consequence of Nazi propaganda was that by 1948, large swaths of the Arab public viewed the Arab, the Jewish state as a mortal threat that had to be violently destroyed. That brings me to my last part titled Aftershock. Radio season ceased operation in April 1945, but its frequencies of hatred remained virulent. Thus, the idea of thwarting a Jewish state at any cost lived on and found a new home in Egypt, where after 1945, the Muslim Brotherhood built the world's largest anti-Semitic movement. By 1948, its membership has risen to over one million. The Brotherhood hailed the Mufti as a man who would realize Hitler's dream. This hero, they rejoiced after the Mufti's return to Cairo in 1946. This hero fought Zionism with the help of Hitler and Germany. Germany and Hitler are gone, but Amin al-Husseini will continue the struggle, end quote. The Mufti did indeed continue this Nazi struggle. He embodies the link between the Nazis' big war against the Jews and its aftershock, the subsequent smaller war of the Arabs against Israel that started in 1948. In 1947, the United Nations decided on the partition plan for Palestine. I show in my book that most of the leaders in the Arab world at that time did not want the fateful 1948 war against Israel. Egypt, for example, questioned this war until the last minute. This is what General Mohammed Haider, Egypt's defense minister, declared at the beginning of May 1948, quote, we shall never even contemplate entering an official war. We are not mad, end quote. And I quote in my book, numerous voices of other Arab leaders who express similar views. These leaders, however, were overtaken by a mass anti-Semitic sentiment fueled by the Muslim Brotherhood and Amin al-Husseini, the Mufti of Jerusalem. Between 1946 and 1948, the general title anti-Zionism that the Nazis had spread until 1945 found an extremely effective echo. Thus, as early as 1948, there was a split between Arab leaders who did not want the official war against Israel and a fanatical Arab street that pushed for exactly this war. Terrified by the Arab street and fearful for their own regimes, the moderate leaders did not dare to confront this anti-Semitic mass sentiment. They gave in. The result was the horrific war of 1948, which led to the Nakba, the flight and expulsion of hundreds of thousands of Arabs from Palestine. And what about today? Today, once again, the Arab street is mobilized. If the Hamas attacks are on innocent Israelis were not upsetting enough, the celebration that broke out in response to it in Arab capitals are utterly revolting. Will the Arab elites, as they did in 1948, once again remain silent and bow to this sentiment? 
or will they understand that anti-Semitism, if left unchecked, will destroy their societies as well? Thank you for your attention. Dr. Consul, uh, thank you so much for your uh, intervention. Um, I think I go back to Talor and Vered. You have heard from both Evan and uh, Dr. Evan and Dr. Uh, uh, Matthias. There is a complicated history behind this, uh, but it's also used almost similar trends. There was a, the broadcasting as the main uh, 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 source of transmission of anti-Semitism between Nazis and the uh, Arab world. I I, I remember uh, looking into into the archives. Uh, 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 one one document is, uh, uh, struck me is a German uh, teacher working in Baghdad writing in the public newspaper, be aware of the Jews, be careful of the Jews, you have to kill them, do exactly what we did in Germany. But that was radio and publications. Now we are facing social media. But in order to understand how to effectively address this, we also need to understand the population and the generation that is actually uh, making these trends. Uh, what, what do you know based on the data you have been collecting? What do you know about the uh, uh, population? Uh, who are they? Uh, what 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 uh, 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 range of age they have? Uh, uh, is there also gender understanding of uh, all of these data? Thank you. It's a great question. And I, I want to express again how honored we are to be on this panel because I was very struck by both presentations of uh, uh, Dr. Ismail and Dr. Kunso. So exactly as you said, why is social media such a concern? It's it's exactly the 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 process that you described. If we understand that traditional media was hijacked by the Nazis in the Middle East in order to popularize this idea of anti-Semitism in the Middle East or anti-Semitism that's rooted in Islam through radio uh, and traditional media, what's happening today on social media is that on steroids. Now it's algorithmically empowered machines. And I also wanted to say, I, I was particularly struck that Dr. Kunzel was highlighting that this was a radio program that was very, very popular. So um, radio programs, just like videos today on social media are almost more popular than text-based um, or ma more radicalizing, I will say, uh, than text-based forms of expression. Why? Uh, in text-based forms of expression, the person has to engage their mind in reading the content and is actually engaged in some level of critical analysis, whether they like to or not, because they have to read. Not the case with radio where you're just listening and certainly not the case with video when you're consuming content and you're more likely to believe the content that you're seeing. So specific conspiracy theories around Jews or Israelis for that matter, or Zionists for that matter, and the way that they are terrorizing the Ummah, that is something that is much more believable when expressed through a video uh, expression. So that's definitely something to be concerned about when we think about the popularization of short videos uh, or short form videos on YouTube and on TikTok. When you asked about specifically the generational aspect of this, the people or the, the Arab street that is using these social media platforms the most, and specifically these video platforms the most, are absolutely the younger generation, the youngest generation um, of the Arab street between the ages of 18 uh, to 30. So they're more likely to believe this content because it's not being communicated in a text-based form, it's being communicated in a video. Um, and it's also just much, much more easy to disseminate um, and have access to on a regular basis. TikTok was the consistently the most downloaded app of the last three years when most teenagers uh, in the West, at least, are reporting using it on average between 40 hours a week on average to up to 100 hours a week. So that gives you an idea when you think about the way the algorithms are working in the Middle East specifically and covering issues like the trends that we saw post-October 7th and reinforcing actually a lot of the anti-Semitic trends that Dr. Ismail highlighted, trends that are connected to the protocols of the elders of Zion, trends that are absolutely connected and rooted in the Hadith, 
um, about why Jews are the enemy of Islam. And this is something that is being reinforced again and again uh, by the social media platform. So we can get into the specific policy recommendations um, of, that we have for social media platforms and for Middle Eastern governments specifically, but I want to also keep it open to the, the panel to jump in and respond to your question as well. Thank you, uh, Talor. Um, Dr. Ismail, uh, uh, you, you, you spoke a lot about the, uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood because it's also one of the oldest Islamist organizations in, in the Middle East. It also inspired many more terrorist organizations. Um, with the current trends, but also keeping in mind dealing with a very young generation, how do we make this type of information available to them? How do we how do we communicate uh, uh, this 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 narrative to show them what anti-Semitism has been and how it's evolving, who was behind it and why it was happening? Uh, I'm a strong believer in education and that this should be part of um, school education here in Europe, for instance, speaking from a European perspective. I believe it's very important to to teach about it as a conspiracy theory. Um, and sometimes it is um, a bit controversial uh, speaking to teachers that they they are afraid um, here in Sweden, for instance, because um, um, Muslim Brotherhood aff affiliated groups claim that this is an attack on Islam, for instance. And so therefore it's important to, to, to make the distinction between the religion and, and uh, the political Islam basically. And I, I believe that when, when this knowledge and education is spread to teachers, um, they should be confident enough to teach school children. Um, it, can, it can be implemented in social science, history, uh, classes and also um, religion, for instance, that's also an opportunity to show how many ideas have been distorted uh, or being distorted. Um, so, yeah, I believe this should be part of uh, all school classes. Thank you, um, Dr. Consul. Uh, one of one of the points that I would like to mention is during the uh, presentation of data being monitored, uh, there were contents coming, written in Arabic, but coming from Germany and the United States. And this is connected to uh, your discussion and also your book about how Nazi propaganda, Nazi anti-Semitism moved to the Arab world. Are we seeing a, a, a recycling of that uh, uh, anti-Semitism going back to, to, to Germany, going back to to the West, how, what, what are the implications uh, of, of, of this anti-Semitism growing uh, among uh, the Arabic speaking uh, uh, populations? Well, what we sent out into the Arab world during the 30s and 40s is coming back now in form of television programs by Al-Aqsa TV or by al Mana TV, by the television programs of Hezbollah and Hamas. And it's coming back and it's now spreading into the children's rooms in the families of Muslims in Germany. And we have five million Muslims. Of course, the big majority is peaceful and not infected by this virus. But there is a radical minority which get all these stuff from the Middle East today. And I would say, well, it's true what uh, Evin Ismail said, we need more education, but in order to have that, we need more programs to teach the teachers. And there are two points which I would like to mention in this regard. The first point is the meaning of re religion in this whole matter. I think, I, I believe that the Quran is not anti-Semitic as such. But it, the Quran has a lot of anti-Judaism uh, in it. But we saw with the Abraham Accords that you can interpret the Quran in different ways. And this is, is an ongoing debate, how to discuss the Quran, which is a very important debate. 
but uh, Western societies are mostly secular and don't believe that religion plays a big role. But in this case, it plays a big, big role. And the second point I would like to mention is that I think the even the elite in the Western world has no comprehension about anti-Semitism in the Middle East. They mainly think, well, this is a question of, is this is a local affair. Uh, Israel has to behave more, more, a bit more nicer, and then anti-Semitism will go away again. And this is not true. They don't want to see the influence of Nazi Germany on the whole region in order to blame and blame and blame the Jews for anti-Semitism in this part of the world, which is not correct, which is not true in historical as a as a historical fact, and it's never true when you discuss anti-Semitism. It has nothing to do with concrete Jewish behavior. The Shoah was not made because the Jews behaved badly, or um, the um, Ritual mod. Um, no, I'm I'm missing one word. But but these are two points: religion and the question how how anti-Semitism evolves in the Middle East are two points which I think would be necessary to raise. Thank you, uh, Doctor Concept. Um, Vered and Talor, uh, once again. Uh, now we have the data. You have been monitoring, you have been collecting all of this data. How do we effectively address anti-Semitism in uh, the Middle East? How how who should be involved in, in addressing it? It it's it's definitely not coming from one source, it's not coming from one generation, it's it has multi-layers, uh, uh, it's mixed with 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 conflicts, it's mixed with uh, uh, political uh, trends in, in, in the Arab world. Sometimes uh, even not connected to Israel, there's an uprising in an Arab country. Then blame it on the Jews. So how do we how do we effectively how do we effectively address it using also the same social media? Mm -hmm. So we put together some policy recommendations for this section that's split up into kind of three uh, parts. One is the social media platforms themselves, and also sharing with the panel and with the group here uh, things that many people don't know about the gaps in social media content moderation or policy moderation enforcement in Arabic versus English, and then also kind of general government recommendations and then a Middle East focus. So I will quickly go over those things now. Um, so first of all, from a social media perspective, there is a major gap in the enforcement, but specifically the resources. So the content moderation and the AI that's dedicated to enforcing policy uh, digital policy in Arabic versus in English. The large majority of resources that social media platforms invest in content moderation are almost exclusively in English. So when it comes to dealing with the wider phenomenon of anti-Semitism in the world, this means that anti-Semitism specifically in Arabic speaking um, countries is getting little to no resources. So it's extremely important that uh, on a government level, when we think even of uh, uh, you know, new policies like the Digital Services Act in the EU, the Digital Services Act in the EU is very much focused on the enforcement of removing illegal hate speech in the EU. The question is, will there be any ability to actually require some kind of investment on the social media platforms front for also investing in enforcement in the Arabic speaking languages? Because as you highlighted, Omar, we are already seeing the migration of this content even into European uh, countries using Arabic language as a vehicle. The other thing that social media platforms can do is actually use positive interventions or pop-up education resources, redirecting users to uh, more informative sources about things like the Holocaust, about things potentially like the Mufti of uh, Jerusalem or the protocols of the elders of Zion. When you see somebody who is interested in these subjects and is searching actively on the social media platforms, the platform has the ability to kind of interact with the user and redirect them to educational sources. And considering the amount that users are using this, these interventions have actually been proven to be rather effective. Um, 
A robust application of hate speech, automated flagging in sounds, images, and videos. A lot of the investment that social media platforms do until today has only been in text. And we really saw this in October 7th with the explosion of graphic content uh, and even the execution and kidnapping of families that were live streamed onto Facebook or onto Twitter. Um, they do have the ability to invest in better automated technology that's rooted in sounds and images. We see that they've had success with this when it comes to preventing things like child pornography or even copyright violation, right? Using sounds without copyright permission. So I really do believe that the initial unfortunate and graphic uh, explosion of, of content that was uh, popularizing and supporting uh, the graphic and uh, horrific attacks that happened to the Israelis on October 7th can be used as an initial data set to actually invest in automatically flagging and removing pro-terror content um, and re-examining the policies regarding the anti-Semitism in Arabic that's rooted in the Quran or Hadith sources. So one of the things uh, that's unfortunate that Velid had mentioned in the presentation is that some of the anti-Semitic trends here that we see that got an uptick post-October 7th are things that we have highlighted to the platforms before and their response coming back to us, for example, with Chaybal Chaybal, for example, with talking about Jews as uh, sons of pigs and, and monkeys, right? That their response sometimes is, oh, well, that has a religious text as its resource. So we don't necessarily want to touch that. And we actually think that there's room to re-examine that uh, because there are A, interpretations of these religious texts, as even uh, Ismail highlighted, number one. And number two, very simply, they're being used to very much promote and reinforce um, anti-Semitism. I don't uh, want to take that. Yeah. Okay, Carol, we're going to stop. Okay. We, we are out of time. Thank you. No problem. Um, <laughs> we, we, we have only three minutes left. And quickly, even one of the pressing issues is when we say Islamism is not Islam and Islamism is manipulating Islam, how do we disengage Islam from this anti-Semitism? How do we, how do we practically uh, 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 be well informed and also inform the public that Islam is not what Islamism is trying to uh, uh, present in relation with anti-Semitism? Sorry, I, I know the time is very short. Short answer, short answer. Um, I, I believe in intellectually engaging with the ideas um, through uh, work, uh, writing, writing mainly. Uh, it should be, uh, but also now um, after this excellent presentation to to have videos and, and, and um, to spread it in social media seems very, very important. Um, Thank you. Uh, Dr. Consul, uh, how do we re-engage history once again in our discussion when we speak about anti-Semitism in the Middle East? Well, I would like to answer the former question, Islam and Islamism. I think we have to be honest. ISIS, with all these terror acts, could draw some leg legitimation from the Quran. So the Quran can be interpreted in different ways. And you, it can be interpreted in a peaceful way, in a tolerant way, and it can be interpreted in a terrible, horrific, racist way. So it's a question how to deal with it. We can't deny that the Quran has some very bad verses which the Muslims have to deal with. So I think it's very important to make clear that it's the question of interpretation. And we need an interpretation which is contable, which, which is um, um, based on values which we have in the Western world. Thank you, Dr. Consul. Uh, Talor and Verit, um, in less than a minute, uh, if if you would say one effective uh, policy recommendation to effectively engage uh, uh, communities in the Middle East in the fight against uh, anti-Semitism. I think that we've mentioned uh, education uh, and we've also mentioned the gap in educating the educators. I also really do believe that we have to have for the countries that are interested in and seek a stability in their country, 
to, to have them onboarded onto an anti-racist and anti-anti-Semitic agenda. That includes sending their bureaucrats and security stakeholders to higher education programs, to events that are focused on anti-racism and anti-Semitism education, and also calling out directly very popular anti-Semitic ideas like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, like religious framed anti-Semitism within the culture. There needs to be active leadership from the leaders in these countries on this issue. Um, Talor, uh, Vered, Evan, uh, for Matthias, thank you so much for your time, for all the insights you brought to the discussion. I would also like to thank all the uh, uh, audience who joined us today for those who posed the questions and for those whom I couldn't answer uh, uh, your questions I apologize for that we were uh, tight on time uh, we hope to see you in another discussion uh, I wish you a great day uh, thank you so much for engaging in this uh, panel thank you thank, thank you, you. Bye. goodbye